Howdy, y'all. Joe Hills here, and today I'm going to be reading Chapter 2 of Jack of All Blades, entitled Peace Through Change. We open page 12 in the office of President Melek Orhan, who is the president of Texas, an adventurer, a scientist, and a shapeshifter. He is sitting behind his desk, which is arrayed with a massive map of the world. Behind him are the coolant towers, or out the window. He doesn't have coolant towers of a nuclear reactor plant in his office, but it is visible nearby. And he is being briefed by William Esquire, a lawyer, the Minister of Truth, the Texan second-in-command, and uh, people actually liked William when, better when he was a death cultist. William still bears the tattoos on his cheek from his death cultist days, but now he's just, you know, a lawyer for a uh, somewhat aggressive empire. So that's, that's a lot better for him. Anyway, so William says, Rome is ours. We only lost 660 men. They lost 2,300, and the rest surrendered. And uh, Melek looks up at him and says, That's higher than I'd have liked on both sides. What's the word from Detroit? And then we cut over to uh, Detroit, where uh, Jill Kepler, the Roman minister of science, Jackie's mom, and a hostage, along with Chif Vishniak, an industrial engineering student and a summer intern in Detroit, is now headed for long-term internment. Uh, are being loaded into an airship, a uh, Texan military airship, by two Texan soldiers. And uh, Billy, re or William Esquire, reports, One ship radioed ahead that they'd captured the Roman Minister of Science and are headed home. And Melek says, Kepler, I'd expected her to be at home. Has Pyron agreed to be our new Minister of Industry? And uh, Billy says, our Minister of Defense is on the ground personally ensuring that Frank Pyron joins us. He's been buttering Pyron up for months, so I'm sure it's going well. And then we see a little thing here. Elsewhere in Detroit, and uh, Jake Kresnek, the Texan Minister of Defense, says, Frank, Texas needs men like you to help us achieve our new global vision. You have a chance to remind the world of your power and secure your place in history. And Frank Pyron industrial executive and last living necromancer replies as energy begins just filling the room around him. He is just bleeding power. And uh, also he is a, I should probably point out, a living skeleton having survived centuries due to a magical accident that occurred when he was young. Anyway, so there's a skeleton that looks really mad, bleeding energy, looking at the Texan Minister of Defense and saying... You people are all the same. You offer me things I already have, and then I kill you. And then we see uh, page 13, Detroit, the Rotor City. And we see Jill and Schiff are looking out the window of the airship they were captured in, and the entire city of Detroit is just exploding uh, as Pyron essentially goes nuclear on them. Not really nuclear, but thaumaturgical. So... Detroit, the Rotor City, the final resting place of Frank Pyron and 800 Texan shock troops. Page 14. Now, this page, the top of it is just a huge map. We actually see the map that was on Melek's desk from a straight-up top-down view, and essentially you can it's broken into different segments. One segment for the New World, one for the Old World, one for Rebecca Land, which is the oldest world, and two other sections, one for Alaska and one for Hawaii. Anyway, so we see a little token that represents Jill Kepler over Detroit in the New World. We see Jack and Jackie tokens uh, that are like up toward Wichita, north of Rome. We see Texan troop tokens surrounding Ben, Rebecca, and a rhinoceros token uh, right to the uh, west of Rome. We get a kind of sense that Rome is kind of squarish and is separated by a river from Texas. The Republic of Texas was originally kind of shaped like a pot or a pan with a little panhandle that led toward Wichita. Uh, to the north is the Native American Ocean. To the east is the Hot Atlantic Ocean. To the west is the Pacific Ocean. And now there's another region, uh, Yorkshire, which is now part of the Republic of Texas, which is a recent annexation. To the south of Rome is Indianapolis along the sea. 
with the specific ocean. And um, to the very far south, though, we see Rebecca Land, uh, and Provo is the only city there. But anyway, so William Esquire, who I will heretofore refer to as Billy, just because I write this comic, and I always think of him as Billy, because he was a death cultist in another, Billy the death cultist in another thing I wrote way back. Anyway, so Billy says to Milk, As for the rest of the royal family, we've captured the king, the queen, and their rhino. And uh, Melix says, excellent. All alive. And we see uh, a whole bunch of Texan troops pointing crossbows at uh, King Ben, uh, Queen Rebecca, and they're riding their rhinoceros. And Billy replies, uh, currently, the, r- the rhino is being euthanized now, and the king and queen will have their turn after the trial. And he just pushes over the little token for the rhino. So then we see the rhino in a room with a doctor who is drawing a syringe out of a bottle marked CN, which I believe is short for cyanide, but I'm not an actual chemist. And then in the next panel, we see that the room and the rhinoceros are now completely covered in blood, and the arm of the scientist is uh, just drooping out of the mouth of the rhino with the sound effect, nom, nom, nom. Page 15. So, Billy, uh, who now has a two arms full of just tokens for the uh, Texan soldier, says, As for Jack and Jackie Kepler, we've been following a trail of bodies north out of Rome. We've got an entire company mobilizing to hunt them down. And uh, so then Melek replies, Forget the company. A platoon will do with the right tracker. I know just the guy. I met him several years back. Back back, back, and we see Melek Orhan as a younger imp, and he is uh, standing in front of a slide that says, a nuclear day for electricity, Melek Orhan, and he's got himself one of them telescopic pointing sticks, and he says, the Indian Napoleon Ministry of Power of Light and Light has electrified the world since the fall of magic. What I show you today will revolutionize the way you generate power. While the late Dr. Watson's biofuel generation techniques are unimpeachable, before his death, he was working on a method both cleaner and more efficient. And uh, one of the and there's uh, three Indian Napoleon uh, ministry members that are sitting at a table, and one of them says, "Impossible. We recovered all of his outstanding research from the remains of his labs." And Melick says, not the one I worked in. Watson did plenty of research that's strictly off the books. And one of the other ministry members says, secret or not, that work is part of Dr. Watson's estate and therefore is the property of our government. Why should we pay you for work we already own? And Melick is standing in front of a slide now that says, it's a matter of geography. And he's bending the telescopic rod, and he looks angry. And he says, because the lab is on Texan soil, jackass. And uh, so one of the Indian Napoleons replies, Texas gets all their electricity from us. Why wouldn't they just hand the lab over? So then we cut to a much less nice uh, conference room that actually has, like, cracked walls, chipped paint, all that. And instead of a slideshow... Uh, Melek now has a flipboard, like, paper stand thing, one of them big pads, and he's, uh, saying, Texas has been dependent on Indian Napoleon energy for too long. I had the good fortune of working with the famous Dr. Watson as he developed a new form of power in a hush-hush lab on our own Texan soil. And there's two guys, uh, sitting in this room. And uh, in the background, it says Ministry of Energy in, like, chipped and horribly applied paint. And one of the guys is kind of older. He's uh, wearing a white cowboy hat and a white suit. And the other guy has a short sleeve blue shirt and a tie. And he asks, uh, and how much would a prototype cost us? And Melek replies, prototype is built. I just need 10,000 snow dollars to prospect for the uranium that'll fuel it. And uh, th- he points at the uh, pad that says U-235 and U. He uh, continues, Watson believed there should be some near the surface in Rebecca Land. 
And uh, th- to the surprise of the guy in the short sleeves, the uh, white cowboy hat minister of energy says, We'll fund it. Kid, if you pull this off, Sunday you'll be sitting in my chair. And the uh, short sleeve guy says, Sir, if Watson really did design this, then the Indian Napoleons own it. This could be an international incident. And the cowboy hat guy says, What do I care? It's my last day. So, we uh, cut to Chekhov's Lagoon, 40 miles east of Provo, and there's a sunken ship partially submerged in the lagoon behind Melik, where he sits drinking a cappuccino. In the far background, we see some sort of ziggurat and potentially some sort of flying lizard creature as well, uh, way off in the distance. Uh, to the... Uh, Right of Millick is a woman uh, who readers of our previous comic, Jack of All Blades 1, would recognize as Wan Wu Tsai reading a newspaper. So, anyway, all of a sudden, Eli Gable, who killed three separate tigers just to get here, despite the fact that he's uh, essentially looks like a child, but he's got a huge katana on his back, he uh, puts his hand on Millick's shoulder and says, You Orhan? That is me, but who are you? Melek replies. And uh, Eli says, I'm Eli, your guide. And Melek says, I'm not hiring you. You are aware you're a little kid. And uh, Eli says, nope, I'm 13. That makes me a teenager. So then we uh, cut back to Billy and Melek in President Melek Orhan's office. And Billy says, wait a minute, if he was 13 then, and this must have been three years ago, then he'd be 16 now. And you want to put a 16-year-old from the jungle wastelands in charge of a platoon? And uh, Melek says, no, not the kid, you idiot. You know what? You don't get to hear my story now. And then the nice little yellow box says, worry not, fair readers. Billy Esquire won't hear this story, but you still will. And then we see... Eli grab a piece of paper from Melek and say, Where are we going? And Melek yells, Nowhere. Mount Guffin! Uh, Eli uh, exclaims as he essentially has swiped the paper. Babies can walk up, Babies can walk up Mount Guffin. The plants there barely try to eat you. And Sai at the next table says, Mount Guffin, eh? I'll be waiting there to cut you open and see who's inside. And uh, her little bio box says, Wan Wu Sai, hostless doppelganger, super creepy stalker. Anyway, so then we uh, see Billy continuing to keep the paper outside of Melek's reach going, Yeah, I'm Malik Oron. I don't even know what a teenager is. And Melek says, wait, that's... And then Eli continues, I'm a big baby who needs an armed guide to help him climb Mount Guffin. Less than six seconds later, uh, Melek is on the deck, and he says, Okay, you're a tough neg- negotiator, so you're hired. Your first task is to shut up. Page 17. One quarter of a wilderness adventure later, we see uh, Billy, or sorry, not Billy, we see Eli and Melek. And they are uh, on a path. There's a fence in front of them and then a uh, cornfield. Beyond the cornfield is a uh, kind of a small, low hill, a pr- kind of a mountain, but not really an intimidating one. Along the far horizon, we see all, all manner of like wizard towers and intimidating shapes. And Eli says, we just had to cut through this cornfield and it's a quick climb. And as they're walking through the corn... Uh, Melek says, I didn't think anyone lived this far from the coast. Who owns these farms? And Eli says, a bunch of crazy people. So then uh, at the foot of the mountain there, there are uh, three farmers, and uh, one of them has a pitchfork. Another one has a uh, reaper, or a, is, I guess that might be called a sickle. I think the reapers are people that carry sickles. Anyway, uh, so and then there's an old guy with suspenders who's carrying no visible weapon. And he says, Looky here, boys. It's that Brad Eli. I'm guessing he's back to steal from us again. And then the guy with the uh, scythe, that's the word, says, And Eli brought a friend. Need he- needed help carrying off our crops? 
And Eli's like, oh, balls. Melek asks, what the heck did you do? And Eli says, nothing. Just follow my lead. Look, we're only passing through. We didn't take anything of yours. Look around. Everything is where it should be. And the farmers look to the left, look to the right. And then Melek is uh, standing there and he says, yeah, Eli here is just my God. And he seems like an honest, where'd he go? And Eli's just completely gone. And uh, the old guy with the suspenders pulls out a club and says, this one's distracting us while Eli escapes. Kick his ass. And Melek shapeshifts into a guy in a suit who is, uh, or a human in a suit. And uh, sound effect, shapeshift. And the scythe flies through the guy's heart, and then the sound effect, abandon shape, as Imp Melek jumps backwards out of the now cast-off form of the suited human. Page 18. Melek is uh, fleeing from the uh, hill people, or farm people, or whatever, crazy redneck people, and a uh, pitchfork is flying past him, uh, right like over his shoulder, and meanwhile swordfish plants are attacking him as well, as he continues down this trail. All of a sudden his foot catches a root, ka-trip, face plant in the dirt, and he sees Eli in in a small hole in the rocks, who says, quick, hide here! And, uh, one of the farmers says, The shapeshifting wizard went that way. Come out so we can kill you again, wizard. And Eli kind of looks at Melek uh, as they're like in this tiny hidey hole and says, Shapeshifting wizard? And Melek thinks, Oh no, I can't let Eli know I can change into people I've bitten, then discard their bodies to avoid certain death. Then he'll never let, him bi- let me bite him when he's not looking. Wait, I know just what to say. Yeah, you are right. These people are crazy. So uh, then uh, Eli pulls himself out of the hole and says, I think they're gone. Let's go. Melek, still in the hole, replies, I'm not following you. You almost got me killed. And Eli says, only because you didn't follow me when I told you to. Come on, I have to report all this to Mr. G. And uh, Melek pats himself off, trying to get some of the dirt off his... uh, nice summer clothes and says Mr. G yeah he's the boss around here everybody myself included has to pay him protection and we clearly need protection from these idiots to get up your stupid mountain and Melek asks is this guy any good and uh, Eli replies he's the best at what he does but he's a complete sociopath and Melek said Uh, replies like just completely frustrated why is everyone here crazy and Eli replies calmly my dad always said this place is like an intro to poetry class no one signs up unless there's already something wrong with them